Welcome to the NYU Jazz Interview Series from the Steinhardt School, and today we'd like to welcome saxophonist Mark Turner. Thank you. <laughs> um, Mark, I'd just like to read something that I pulled off the internet. Um, get your comment on this. <laughs> Saxophonist Mark Turner has steadily built a career as one of the lesser ballyhooed, if no less talented, jazz saxophonists of his generation, indebted to such icons of musical intellectualism as Wayne Shorter, John Coltrane, and Warren Marsh. Turner has a fluid, egoless style grounded in motivic, harmony-based improvisation that's always understated, yet never fails to grab the audience's attention. Have you heard that before? Um, yeah, I, I think I've heard maybe that one before. So, yeah. <laughs> what should I right, say about question. it? <laughs> what to do? So, um, <laughs> do I agree with it or do I not agree with it? Well, and let's just, question is, uh, using your term, let's uh, unpack that a little bit. Right. That was something I learned from you last week. <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, understatement, uh, less ballyhooed. Mm -hmm. I don't know how often you use that word. I don't know. Yeah, but, I, uh, I don't. But... but I don't <laughs> You know, most people, uh, the reason we do this interview series is kind of get, mm. try to get inside the head of the artist. Yeah, sure. So 
that's my mission today is to figure out where are you coming from musically yeah. and, mm -hmm. and how do you envision uh, saxophone playing and the harmonic aspects of it as, mm -hmm. as well as the uh, melodic aspects and sure. uh, how do you how do you envision you as a as a musician within this milieu of other modern musicians and right. and the and the direction of music that you're pursuing mm -hmm. so the first thing is maybe your understatedness mm -hmm. um, uh, I know that a lot of your m musical influences come from uh, the maybe the Tristano school and Warren Marsh. Sure, that's part of and it. And yeah. Coltrane mm -hmm. and uh, Wayne Shorter, maybe. Mm -hmm. So, can you talk about uh, maybe what were your first influences, mm -hmm. and we'll move on from there. Okay, um, I would say maybe from the very beginning, um, probably R and B for my parents. They. Uh, they had some jazz records too. My first jazz records that I'd listened to were their records, and actually, my my stepfather and my biological father both had records. My biological father actually loved Sonny Stitt, so he had quite a few Sonny Stitt, Gene Ammons records. So those are the first ones I heard. But basically, my parents. I grew up in L.A., so my parents um, they're pretty social, and they had a lot of pool parties and stuff in the 70s <laughs> and they'd be playing you know the Ohio players Stevie Wonder you know Otis Redding the OJs you know so on and so forth Al Green so that's kind of what I heard mostly so I'm not I guess my music doesn't sound anything like that but but that's what I heard mostly you know and then uh, in terms of jazz again it was Sonny Stitt Sonny Rollins um John Coltrane, those are the records my parents had. And they had some some singers records too, I don't remember exactly, but so that was the beginning when I was a kid. You know. And as a kid, it seems like you pursued what other kids did. You were in high school band. Yeah. You started with clarinet exactly. and then alto and yeah, tenor. Exactly. Yeah, all the same, you know. When was it that you stuff? really latched onto something and said, This is of great interest to me? Um, oh, that, the point where I did that. You know, it's kind of funny because I don't know if I really, I did in the sense that I really liked music and I, at some point, you know, you get to the point where you decide you want to practice a lot and so on and so forth. Maybe that was the latter part of high school. Uh, but I hadn't decided that I wanted to be a musician. I just, I loved jazz and music and I just wanted to, I just put myself in it, but I wasn't, it wasn't until maybe third year of college where I thought, maybe I should try and be a musician. And before that, I was basically in the art world. I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be an illustrator. I was in school for that. And um, the point where I decided to try music was when I was in um, I was in San Francisco. My parents moved to San Francisco. And I was at an art school there, which I really loved. And I was with this art teacher that was fantastic. Um, and at that point, I don't know why I decided. In a way, it was crazy because I was happy I was doing well. And I decided I transcribed a John Coltrane solo. is the first one I transcribed. And I, I did it without the horn. I didn't know anything about it. And I said, oh, let me just write this solo down. It felt really great. Let me try and go to Berkeley because some of my friends went there. And then I went to Berkeley. And my parents were supportive somehow. I don't know why. And then... <laughs> So that's what happened. <laughs> so that's what I kind of decided to try and be a musician. What do you mean you just wrote the solo down? I mean, I, I didn't use my horn. I uh, listened to it and I just, I wrote it down and uh, tried to play it, you know, like you would normally do, transcribe solos. And so that's what I meant by that. At the, there wasn't until later I, I, you know, I guess I uh, spoke to some other musicians and, um, they were surprised that I wrote it down. I didn't know anything about transcribing at all. I didn't even know there was such a thing as transcribing. I just... Well, I'm surprised that, that you just wrote it down because most people would listen to something and mm -hmm. then try to play along with it. Right. So did you write it down using a piano or do you have good pitch? I guess I had good pitch. I didn't know anything about it. So I, I just... Uh, I had some music paper. I listened to the solo and I wrote it down. And then I tried to play it afterwards on the, on the horn. So... Uh, 
this story was conveyed to me by mm -hmm. one of your uh, friends that went to Berkeley with you. Oh, okay. And uh -huh. he says that when he first met you, mm -hmm. you came in sounding like Michael Brecker, mm -hmm. very influenced by that. And right. you would be at jam sessions and you'd be there the longest. Right. And he'd leave and come mm -hmm. back two hours later and you were mm -hmm. still playing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said the next summer you came back mm -hmm. and you sounded like Coltrane. Mm -hmm. And he said you had gone home over that next summer and transcribed a, a stack of Coltrane recordings. Mm -hmm. And you came back and you did the same thing. You were at the same sessions, mm -hmm. playing for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. So what is it in your process? Is it, uh, are you a very inquisitive person that you have to uh, understand the process by transcription and analysis and then working it out on your horn mm -hmm. and do it, doing it maybe obsessively I don't know uh, yeah I, I don't know about it obsessively I, th I think uh, I think there are definitely people that are way more into that than I am but I definitely uh, I think that um, I think that I, I enjoy the process of learning and I that alone is interesting to me even even more than the, the as much or more than the, the end product so once you get there you've done it and then all right, then what's next, you know, in a way. So uh, part of it was just that. I was just so curious about how come, I guess, the, I, maybe put it this way shortly, is that, the, you know, you find something that you really enjoy, you love it. For example, at one point, I really liked Michael Brecker, John Coltrane, Warren Marsh, a bunch of other musicians. And a lot of it is just figuring out why is it that I like this person? What is it that I enjoy about them? What's the connection between... Uh, myself and this musician and uh, one way to do it partially is to actually figure out what do they actually play and feel what it feels like to play like them and so you really get a taste of taking the, the master taking you by the hand and saying this is how you play music um, and if you do enough of them you get more of a taste of it really and um, so for me, a lot of it is just that, just trying to figure out how to play music, figure out what's my connection with this person, what, am I, what do I want from them, what do they have to, to give me, and uh, feeling it physically in your hands, writing it down, contemplating it, trying to assimilate it into yourself so that it feels natural. Um, that process is very, I found very satisfying. Um, and it just, it helped me and still helps me to learn how to play. I think other people learn more by osmosis or just actively playing. I definitely need to, you know, learn every single tree in the forest and put them all together over time, a very long, long time. In order to play, I realized that about myself early on. So there wasn't much of an issue about how come I'm not learning so fa fast enough? How come, you know, other people can just play and it works out? I knew that wasn't going to happen. So I, was, I figured I'm going to do what I need to do to um, make music satisfying. So maybe that's what, what it was. If you had to uh, pull these artists apart and, and assess them for what made them unique or interesting to you, mm -hmm. because you've assimilated and, and really did an analysis, if you took like Warren Marsh, for instance, what was it? Yeah. What would you say is the essence of his music and his process that you've taken for your own? Um, I think one part is that um, initially I was attracted to him because at that time when I started trying to transcribe him and others like him, I was trying to figure out what I still I'm still trying to figure it out. But at that point, I was maybe a little bit more. Uh, in the four is that I was trying to figure out how to improvise, you know, okay, you have some vocabulary and language, what are you going to do with it? So I was trying to figure out, you know, who, uh, what musicians felt like they were basically using what they had and, and uh, kind of flying on the seat of their pants, trying to make things happen without actually falling over, you know, maybe like riding on the crest of the wave or whatever it is, you know. So, where Marshall was one of those, and I was attracted to him also because he did it without a whole lot of drama, you know? It's basically content. And I was interested in how is he, how is he able to uh, 
use content placement, sound, and content meaning melodies, the way he plays the harmony, where he places the notes, how he, how he plays with the rhythm section to create a sense of, um, the, create the sense that he's, he's uh, always on the edge. You know, where you, to me, I'm listening to him, I feel my hair is standing on end because it sounds like he's always almost about to fall over, but it never quite happens. So I wanted to know what that was. And so that's the main thing, you know, about how he processes information, you know, and how he's able to, he almost, it's very, he almost never repeats himself. If you transcribe enough souls, you'll see. Everyone has something that they do, certain language that they have. Uh, and some musicians, you can find more repetition in their language. This is not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. But with him, very, very little. So I was looking for that. How is he able to take language, have it still sound familiar, and not repeat himself and still keep it interesting, rational, um, forward moving, and so on and so forth? A few weeks ago, I had uh, bassist Richard Bona here. Mm -hmm. And he had made the statement that uh, nobody truly improvises, mm -hmm. that they've worked out their process, and they mm -hmm. continue to work out and perfect that process. And he says the only time that anyone really improvises would be like if you're in the jungle mm -hmm. and there's a, uh, there's a tiger facing you. <laughs> well, that's probably true. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> So now your process of improvisation, I, I know it's, it's very specific because of the, the classes you've been offering our students at NYU. Um, what do you think of that idea? Is, is, is your music improvised or is it worked out? I think, they're, I think that, uh, that's a whole other discussion. What is improvising? You know, what's improvisation? What does it mean? Uh, I think. I agree to that, to, to what Richard Bona was saying to some extent. Uh, I would say my music is a combination of both. That's probably true for everyone, you know. You have to work out something. You know, if you play a major scale, it's worked out. You know I mean? It's a major scale, that's it. Um, you know, we're all doing things that, you know, you play certain uh, chord progressions. You're playing a certain, it's been worked out before you. So, you know, you play Western music, I mean. Just you're already stepping into something that's worked out. If you were to improvise, you'd have to start from the ground up completely. You have to write, make your own instrument, you know, work with another tonal system, so on and so forth. So nobody really does that that I know of. Um, I think the improvisation that we're talking about, that I involved myself in and tried to engage in as much as possible, is working with um, the information that uh, working with the music in my own culture um, that that I'm I'm steeped in that I'm representative of, and trying to um, use that and um, and speak like now we're speaking on a subject. I'm improvising. I'm talking. I'm using language and in my own culture, in my own language, and in a context. So I think that's what improvisation is. If I weren't improvising, then I'd have a speech written out, and I'd know what questions you were going to ask me, and then I'd read that speech. That's not improvising. So I'm talking about this kind of improv imp improvising. That's also, I think that's improv improvising, and I also think that that's uh, relevant. You know. Now let's speak in Russian. <laughs> OK, I can't do that. You got it. OK. <laughs> so, but we're speaking within a framework of. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Now, so. the other night when you gave your lecture, mm -hmm. uh, I had asked you about playing modally because mm -hmm. your whole lecture was talking about cadences and mm -hmm. resolution. And when we came up to modal, you, you had mentioned the word, well, we have to unpack this now. Mm -hmm. But uh, you made this analogy was uh, playing in, in a modal key, maybe one key D minor. Uh, it's like envisioning a desert and you're slowly building cities Within, within this desert. Could yeah. you talk about what that means? Yeah, I think what that means is that you're, you're uh, one, you're building a storyline, but harmonically speaking, you're building um, reference points, um, you know, corners, so to speak, in which to, you're building a room, a house, or cities, or places in which to go, in which you can tell your story. Otherwise, it's kind of a 
complete, uh, when I say a desert, I mean a completely open, absolute, um, uh, yeah, clean slate, which is, that's not what we're dealing with. We're always dealing in the relative world, you know. Their thoughts, uh, people, places that we're making reference to, and that's how we relate to each other. A clean slate, an absolute vacuum, is nothing that we actually deal with. So, a one, a one chord just sitting there in an absolute desert is kind of, we need to build something so that we can say something over this desert. So, that's kind of what I mean by that. You know, and you can do it, you know, musically speaking, you would do it in a number of bars, certain chords, you know, kind of create reference points for yourself, the band, and the audience to feel tension release, because that's, that's mainly what we're dealing with most of the time in music, you know, in order to tell a story. Based on the influences that you've, you've uh, uncovered with Marsh and Shorter and Coltrane, how much of that is informed, or how much of that is, is within your process, but how much new material have you uncovered for yourself? Uh, I don't know. That's a hard question. What do you mean by new material? Well, it's you, think, you know what it's it's just like for instance, Coltrane uh, was very studious. Mm -hmm. uh, Slanimsky's Thesaurus of Melodic Scales, for yeah. instance, and mm -hmm. uh, Messian scales, and yeah. you talked about the other day, mm -hmm. and studying with people like uh, Dennis Sandoli and the Granite School. Mm -hmm. He was always looking for different ways yeah. to find theoretical approaches. If it's mm -hmm. uh, uh, major thirds, etc., mm -hmm. uh, extracting all those elements from the various people that you've studied, mm -hmm. have you have you uncovered anything for yourself that's offered you a new direction? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, new in the sense of I feel that it's uh, maybe it's um, uh, individual to some extent. I can say that. I think new is something that other people decide. I can't make that decision, but I definitely feel that you know over time I found my own process. There's vocabulary, harmony, so on and so forth that uh, I feel is. Uh, personal, individual, intimate to some extent. So if that means new, then it is. I don't know what that the rest means. But Well, I think yeah. part of this is your interest in classical music as well, because if we look at the, 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 the jazz process, um, uh, modal music in the 60s was similar to modal music from the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. Or free jazz might mm -hmm. be attributed to maybe s some form of serial music Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you're still uh, uncovering things in, in by listening to classical music and mm -hmm. analyzing sure. that. So is there anything that you've uncovered that way? Um, that's a difficult one. Uh, yeah, to some extent, I'm still, I'm still, I mean, there's, I'm still working on all of it. I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty, it's a lot of music to understand, but yeah, I, the, the classical slash European tradition has definitely helped me quite a bit. Um, one, in terms of harmony voice leading uh, and ways to access to as, ways to access it and understand it um, that I maybe would not have encountered if I only listened to music from the American slash jazz world. Uh, some of it may be vocabulary, for sure, you know, just looking at scores, etudes, um, and making, um, learning how to make patterns or lines out of them. Um, yeah, those things I've uncovered. Most of it's been it's basically uh, melodic and harmonic language and vocabulary for the most part. Well, something that I've been thinking about since I, I attended your class the other day was... Um, if we look at chord structures as vertical, mm -hmm. and we take the chord structures and move them horizontally, yeah. and then fill in the gaps between the root, third, fifth, et cetera, yeah. we come up with scales. Mm -hmm. So we have to decide which scales, based mm -hmm. on those triad or dominant seven mm -hmm. or whatever harmony. Yeah. Um, so the process of improvisation has been taught and almost probably formalized by the use of chord scales. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. Whereas the, what you're talking about in your class is you're actually going back to a vertical process in, in your improvisations, it, looking at chord progressions, you're really outlining the root, the third, seventh, and then mm -hmm. picking a ninth or something to outline the chords mm -hmm. rather than consider, oh, I can just use a blanket scale sure. and realize this. And I think this is something that's really unique to you. Mm -hmm. Can you discuss that? Uh, yeah. Um, I started... Um, trying to access it partially in the beginning it started by just listening to, to Coltrane actually and then uh, um, I started playing with uh, uh, Kurt Rosenwinkel's band um, and I, he trying to play his tunes um, I realized his tunes are very specific and the vocabulary is very specific and I started writing down um, uh, voicings on all the chords, you know, and voice leading them just to figure out how to get chord sound and how to make the chord sound. So, for example, I might have been playing the right notes, but they weren't the right notes. Right notes in the sense that, you know, okay, you know, you're playing the fifth on a minor chord, uh, but for some reason it doesn't sound right. Why not? So I've, I started trying to figure out what that was about. How come some notes sound better than others? And what does that mean? So that's when I started uh, started to do voice leading on the saxophone, and then going back and reading um, uh, uh, classical harmony books from various composers. I'm still doing it. Um, I'm trying to figure out most of, most of that is what I found was taught basically in voice leadings. There are uh, um, even the composition books, most of them, there's always voice leaning. It's rare that you just see a chord symbol, you know, and the chord symbols are usually written in numbers, which, which everyone's probably seen, which usually denotes, you know, the positions of the notes in a chord, whether they're um, in root position or inversions or whatever. Uh, and I found that intriguing because usually in jazz we just see chord symbols. There you. You have to actually look at the voice leading before you figure out what the chord is. It won't say, you know, C major. You have to look and see what what it is. So I was intrigued by that, and um, the more I started getting into that and trying to figure out a pl how to play, uh, for example, Kurt's tunes and other people's tunes and other bands that I I uh, was playing in, it was easier for me gradually. I'm not saying it's easy, but it became more facile to be able to play the harmony and get it to sound uh, the way it should sound, given the person's tune, given the melody, given the, the chord progression, so on and so forth. So um, that's kind of what prompted me to do that. So I just felt like I really love harmony, and I felt like just playing um, based on the scale alone is not enough for me personally, you know. It reminded me when years ago when I used to play in these old dance bands and they'd have the stock arrangements mm -hmm. and when it came to the solo, it wouldn't have the chords written out. It would mm -hmm. just have the chord voicing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was difficult for me because it's like mm -hmm. you're so used to uh, assimilating right. the scale rather right. than the voicing. Mm -hmm. right. So in a sense, it's, it's kind of a new process and I know a lot of your students are here today mm -hmm. and uh, you fill them up with this other approach mm -hmm. that they may may not have accessed before mm -hmm. and they always come back to me and I said well what did Mark teach you he says mm -hmm. uh, you know years of practice of things before I'm ready to play this style mm -hmm. so you, you're 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 a, a, a fountain of knowledge young man okay uh, <laughs> but let's talk about that for a minute mm -hmm. it's like uh, obviously, you've worked long and hard, mm -hmm. many hours of trying to figure out this voice leading process. Mm -hmm. Because the other day after class, you revealed, you said, you know, I'm a very slow learner. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. So, so if you're a slow learner, how long did it take you to, to assimilate this process that you've discussed with your students and in this class? A very long time. <laughs> um, yeah, I... I I don't know. It's been uh, 
You mean the beginning of starting to, to voice lead and all that, or well, exactly? Well, I, I think you mean in general, do you, you, mean you know, when people hear you play, and all that, or right. But people. I think in this class, you were sitting at the piano saying, "Well, you could do this, or you could do this, or you could do this, or this leads to this, and this leads to this," and mm -hmm. nothing was written out, and mm -hmm. and all the students are saying, "Yes, I get it." Mm -hmm. And then I ask him later, wow, there was a lot of information. Mm -hmm. So it says to me that you've spent a lot of time just totally assimilating this so that it, it, uh, it's part of your, your speaking voice. Uh -huh. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. How long did that take? And how much, how much practice and thought on the horn and off the horn or at the piano oh. was involved? Uh, I, would say, uh, I would say just for me, but that's probably similar for most of my friends too, but, uh, at least, um, when did I start trying to do that? Yeah. And I, maybe in the late eighties, nineties, I guess. Yeah. Right around then I just started trying to figure out voice leading and things. And so how long is that? 25 years or something. Did so you find that, that you were the only person doing this at the time? Oh, I think, no. Well, I don't know. I mean, about saxophone players, I don't know. But definitely, um, no, I guess, I no, I mean, other, you know, guitar players, piano players I knew for sure, and bass players and stuff. I wasn't, no, I mean, they were doing too. Maybe it's more uh, natural for their instruments. They're playing string instruments, so that's what they do all the time. But they, you know... I'll go back again to Kurt's band. So, you know, myself, Kurt and Ben and other people, uh, we were spending time on harmony, but always trying to, if you want to use the word, unpack it, you know, trying to figure out what sounds best and why it sounds good and making sure that, um, uh, for lack of a, a better word, that the voice leading was... Uh, precise, trying to figure out what that means. You know, because for example, if you're playing a, a dominant chord, that can mean all kinds of things. If even in two bars, if someone's voice leading, it can go through all kinds of versions. It depends, you know. So um, I'd say, you know, a lot of it was discussions with friends, writing things down for myself, musically and verbally, you know, the written word and. Um, uh, writing notes down, having notes by them, this means that, this means that, this works here, oh, I played a gig here, this is what, that means this tune is such and such, for example. So, you know, just daily hours of practicing during the day, uh, practicing meaning, playing some of the piano, playing the saxophone, thinking about it, going back and doing it again, ruminating, you know, so on and so forth. So. Um, I think a lot of it is, um, a lot of that in particular is just having a, um, gradually clarifying your aesthetic and trying to figure out what you need to do to reach that aesthetic, if you know what I mean, you know, otherwise, you know, there, you can be practicing for, uh, millennia. I mean, you can practice one or two things for hours and hours and hours, 24 hours a day until you die. You know, you have to decide on something, right? To focus what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, how you're going to do it. So I don't know if that answers your question, but yes. <laughs> uh, I had Chris Potter on stage here a while back, and I had brought up the, a conversation. He called me once and said, mm -hmm. uh, "Hey, can I get into the school to practice?" Yeah. And it was over the summer. I wasn't around. I said, "What are you talking about? You're Chris Potter. You don't need to practice." <laughs> And he says, he goes, I, I, I not only want to practice, but I need to practice. Yeah. I need to, and it was this, uh, uh, you know, as aggressive as he gets, there's this need mm -hmm. to play the horn. Yeah. Do you have that same need? Absolutely. I do. <laughs> yeah. So what happens really if you don't practice? Um, if I don't practice, I feel terrible. I feel like a bad boy. <laughs> no, I I just feel um you know, I feel um which is funny because now I you know, I, I don't get to spend as much time as I used to before uh, 
before my wife and I had children. But uh, any time, chance I get, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 10 minutes there, an hour there, it usually adds up. But uh, it's just a need of discovery for me. I'm sure Chris feels the same way. For music to be satisfying, I'm sure he feels, and I feel, you need to be on the horn to be able to, you know, have an in intimate connection with it so you can speak on it. If you don't get enough time on it, then you, you lose it, you know? It's not just thinking about it, it's, it's all the above. And you get on the horn, you, it's so satisfying. Even just to, just to play long tones, you know? It just feels fantastic, I love it, you know? Just the, I just feel, I've, I feel highly unsatisfied with, uh, I don't know, I just, I feel like I, I just need to be on it. I don't know what else to tell you. So, can you talk about um, your uh, meditation practice or your Eastern interests and how that applies to you as a as a person and to musically, maybe? Um, sure. Um, I'm not sure what to say about that, but um, uh, I would say that uh, meditation practice in general, at least for me, it um, kind of helps to put um, all life matters in perspective, you know? Because um, I definitely find the older you get, at least the older I get, the more crazy you can get, <laughs> you know? Um, Especially if you don't practice. Definitely. <laughs> Even that needs to be, you know, uh, looked at in a rational way, or at least, you know, why is it that you feel, or I feel, does need to practice? There might be reasons that are uh, not helpful to my mental state, you know, wanting to practice, maybe deficiencies in other aspects of my life. So I need to take a look at them, you know. Uh, and that doesn't mean I can't go ahead and practice, but, but anyway, it just helps to put things in perspective, calm the mind, in particular, make, it helps to make you mindful. It definitely helps you to pay attention to what you're doing while you're there and not be in a sense, daydreaming, wondering, thinking, desiring, uh, being upset with the past or the future. And it definitely helps in terms of music, at least for me. Um, one, in your practice time, it helps to be, just pay attention and do what you're doing at any pace that you need to do it. And then when you're playing, you're playing. Not thinking, this was terrible, that was great, I should be doing this, I shouldn't be doing that. Just play, and nothing else. So... Um, meditation practice has definitely helped with that. Do you try to use this meditative practice to get in a zone when you're performing? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say it's literally that I go back in a room and I meditate, but it just influences the rest of your life. And you find ways to um, put yourself in that state more often, even if you're talking to somebody or you're washing the dishes or you're playing music or anything else. Well, I, uh, I'd like to talk about your, your path at music and, and why you've chosen music. We've had discussions about this is your passion sure. and uh, this is what you do artistically. Because mm -hmm. I know uh, you've, you've had odd jobs early on. Did yeah. you work at Tower Records for a I while? I did work at Tower Records, yeah. Okay, on West 4th here? <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, yeah. So sometimes... Uh, Developing a career as a, as a musician, as an artist, mm -hmm. doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, that's true. And uh, the fact that odd jobs are available and, and mm -hmm. finding out times to uh, eke out uh, a musical presence is, yeah. is difficult. But, yeah. but what is it that's uh, important to you or satisfying in that process? Um, about trying to, to uh, pursue, pursue your career, pursue something that you're passionate about, mm -hmm. because uh, we've had this conversation mm -hmm. about s sometimes students don't know why they're going to music school, okay. or, they're, mm -hmm. or they, they're not mindful of what the teachers are saying. I see. Mm -hmm. So. I say for myself, I, I, uh, when I was in music school, I, um, I didn't know if I was going to become a musician. In fact, I assumed that it'd be very likely that I was not going to be able to make a living at it. But I loved doing it, so I, was, I kind of went for broke. I just need to do it. And uh, while I'm in school, this is the only time in my mind was the only time where I'm not going to have a job, to a day gig, 
uh, no children and no significant other, uh, this is where I, you know where I need to spend that time outside of music. This is the only time where I'm going to have me time, 24 hours a day. I better use this stuff now. So that's kind of what my attitude was. So that's all I did. I just practice as much as possible, engage as much as possible in music, whatever the teachers told me. I used what I could at the time, and I kind of had little notebooks and things for later when I got out of school to be able to access it later because, you know, it was too much information. I couldn't get all together. And I felt like, you know, I, I loved music, and I was just going to try and do the best I could. And if I didn't get to be a musician, I'd still have music in my life, you know. Uh, maybe I would, you know, do something else, but um, I'd still play saxophone and I'd still be involved. So that was kind of my attitude. I I had no, um, I didn't feel entitled at all to become a musician. Um, I still don't. It's, it's still kind of an adventure. Like I'm, I'm still trying to keep it going. I'm glad it's still going. It could end at any moment. It could be done next year. You know. So that's kind of been my attitude about it. I'm just keeping it going, keeping music in my life, being involved in musical, jazz, art, culture. And I think that's an important thing to continue. So I'm, and I, I'm happy to do jobs. So I had other jobs, you know, I was, I worked at Tower for a year and a half. I was a bike messenger. I painted houses. I played on the street and made a pretty good amount of money for that. <laughs> While I was working at Tower um, to pay for uh, paid for dinner and stuff a lot of times because I didn't quite make enough money at Tower, blah, blah, blah. So um, I was willing to keep doing that as long as I needed to. Like if I need to do an extra job now and I don't have enough gigs, I'll do it. You know? So I don't know if that answers the question. But yes, but, but there was you were excited about the opportunity that uh, this is a school, is a place to grow oh, man. and to immerse yeah. yourself. Absolutely. I felt like... I felt like that, and I felt like I didn't want to waste my my parents and ancestors' resources. You know, my parents worked their asses off. Excuse me, <laughs> so I can go to school. My grandparents did too. So you know, I shouldn't waste my time here. You know, so yeah. Now that opening statement I made about uh, there's less ballyhoo about you, mm. and, and maybe part of that is because you don't seem like a very aggressive person. You're very mm -hmm. passive, except maybe in your playing. Mm -hmm. um, how, was, was there a point where you had to be aggressive to get into professional situations, or did people mm -hmm. find you? Um, I would say I definitely have never been aggressive in that sense. I, I wouldn't know how to do it. I think there are other people that can do it well, and it's part of their personality, and I think all the power to anyone who needs to do what they need to do to get where they're going. Um, I would say that uh, I, what I did and I do is I just put myself in situations where I'm available and visible. It's probably better to say it like that. In other words, when I was younger, um, and still maybe less now, but um, I just put myself in situations where I could be seen, where I... You know, I might go to sessions. I may not like the session, but I'd go. Or I'd play some gigs with in situations where I may not necessarily like the gig, but I'd get experience, meet other musicians. And other musicians might be in that situation to say, oh, that's great, you know, oh, you sound good, blah, blah, blah. Why don't we play this other gig over here? And then that, that other gig would happen, and someone else sees you, and then you play that other gig, oh, it gets a little better, so on and so forth. So that's kind of how things have worked out for me, more or less. It's like that, word of mouth being as many situations, at least early on, that would lead to something else, you know? So you just didn't sit in your basement no, and practice, yes? I did not. I either practiced or I was out playing somewhere else, a session or a gig or whatever, yeah. So in our last few minutes, I, uh, I always asked our guests if they have any uh, words of wisdom or advice for those people that follow you mm -hmm. and uh, you've, you've helped shape their careers and maybe other people that aren't familiar with you and maybe mm -hmm. they will be now. Uh, words of advice and wisdom, I don't know. Um, I would say one thing that maybe is, um, hmm. Um, 
maybe, you know, to stay involved, active and mindful of what you're doing without expectation, expectation of results. I think that help, it's helpful. I guess the short of it is, you know, uh, be present in the process, but I don't think that really exemplifies what I'm saying. You know, just be involved, work, do, be mindful of it, what, it, what's, what its effect is on yourself and others without expecting it to be, uh, without expectations for what the results might be, whether they're great or whether they're terrible or whether you turn into getting exactly what you want. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. You don't know where things are going to lead you. At least that's the case with me, you know. As long as you're engaged, involved, and um, uh, kind of uh, taking control of your effect on the universe, because you are a part of the universe, you know, it's kind of magical. If you believe and take that belief and put it to, into action, something's going to happen. You know, I don't know what, but something will happen for sure. So. Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. We've learned a lot. Thanks. My Mark pleasure. Turner, everybody. Thanks. Awesome. Uh-huh.
Mm-hmm. 